Hi, my name is Sean Beasley. I want to introduce you to the all-new Snooty 7. Let's dive right in and see how easy it is to get set up and running. Now, I know this seems like a daunting task, and it can be if you do not have the correct skills, but I wish to take the confusion out of this a little. So I'll take a freshly installed Rocky Linux distribution. This makes life much easier. We will update the repositories, install the prerequisites, and while we are already doing the heavy lifting on the command line, we'll just go ahead and install the database using the delivered scripts. Optionally, you can use the web installer. I'll show that in a separate video. Updating the repositories verifies your internet connection and gets the base system up to date. We'll then install the needed tools for compiling required Perl modules, install the base components including the MySQL server which is optional if you're using a central server or Postgres SQL. Then we'll install the software directly via the project's download server. Afterwards we'll configure the MySQL server, create the database and the user, modify the user's configurations for the Apache web server and for Snooney. We'll finally create an initial admin user enable and start our services, and then log into the freshly created instance. In a later video, we'll cover all the basics needed in order to get your instance up and running completely. We'll now log in per SSH. As you see, I'm already logged into my server and get the administrator privileges. So now we're the root user, and we can update the Rocky Linux installation by running the following command. Now this will take a while depending on your internet connection speed and these commands and the script will be available in the description of the YouTube video so that you can cut, copy and paste these commands as you see fit. Now I've fast forwarded through the installation to save a little bit of time in this video and we've finished the update. Now that we have no issues with our repositories, we can go ahead and set up SE Linux so that we don't have any problems running our installation. In order to do this, we want to edit the following file. This is the se linux.conf or se linux config and we want to set the enforcing to uh, disabled or permissive. I choose disabled. And when we do this, we just want to run reboot so we can apply the changes. Again, I'll pause the video, and when I'm back on, on the server, then we'll continue on with the installation. So we are back, and we will now enable a special repository. The Code Ready Linux Builder repository is a repository for developers and includes many required PER modules. So we will enable this. And this is Red Hat Linux 9 or Rocky 9 specific. It has a another name in the other versions it's called power tools so it check the version that you're using if you're not using the version 9 that you enable the correct repository and of course we'll do this as the super user and we'll just log in as the super user for general purposes for the rest of the video. So now that the CRB is enabled, we can install the necessary modules. These are um, also done with the DNF command. We will install the EPEL release, the make program, to compile modules that we'll need, the GCC, CPAN minus for ease of use with the CPAN tool, the MySQL server, and also the HTTPD server. It shouldn't take too long. Once this is all installed, we have the basis what we need to get started and we will install all of the required Perl modules. I'm going to copy the 
Chrome Ultra list out of my script. I recommend you do the same to save some typing. And once the base modules are installed, we'll paste that into the command line and install the required Pro modules. Just one other Pro module will be needed. We'll be installing that from the CPAN repository, that's the iCal parser, or the upcoming iCal integration. Be able to see your appointments directly in a modal as well as do other wonderful things with them later as the feature continues to develop. But just seeing the ICS files in the front end is a great relief. So the installation is complete. Here's the command that we're going to be using. We're going to use DNF also to install Perl Moodle, Perl Mail, IMAP Client, Perl UUID, the YAML library, and the MySQL driver, as well as Mod Perl. And as I said, we still have one other module. This is the iCal parser. This can just be installed. Make sure you're root at this point and using this command. So now that this is finished, we can go ahead and install the software directly from the repository from the project using the DNF command. Please check the version at the time of this recording. It was 7.0.2. the end of the installation please make sure to note the URL that you'll need otherwise you'll have to look into the documentation for the proper URL to log into the server or check the end of this video when we log into the server ourselves. Here you'll see some information about running the automation using the daemon and the cron tools or the cron scripts included to make sure that your system will run properly and even after a reboot continue to maintain its normal operation. This completes the basic installation and we're going to go on to configuring the Apache and the MySQL servers. I again will use uh, some commands out of my script which will be available in the YouTube notes at the bottom. Let's modify the Apache installation first by configuring the web server to use the npm prefork, prefork versus the npm event module. We will use scd command to read the npm cont file and to remove the event module and to add the npm prefork module. You can of course edit this file manually or use the commands that you find below in the script. Now that the modules are loaded, we'll go ahead and enable the um, server to run using system control and the enable command HTTP and we'll set now so that it starts running immediately. Now the web server is up and running, but we will have to ask us access it. The firewall is running basically on the um, server from the very beginning. So we'll add the service HTTP and we will make it permanent so that it will survive a restart. and then we will do a reload. In this last step, we'll now configure the MySQL. We'll create a configuration file, especially for this, and we'll call it etc myconf.dd. It's a new conf. And we open this file. And when we do, we'll add some basics to our server. So I will just insert and paste out of my script. We need to make sure that the allowed package size is 256 megabytes. We need to make sure that we're using InnoDB Inno file per table. It's not necessary, but it's, it's recommended. We want to set the log file size to 256 megabytes and here also the um, Max allowed packages to 256 megabytes. So closing this file, we can move on to
to enabling the system as well. Do this also with system config, uh, system control. Now the MySQL server is up and running. We'll run the three commands that we need. I'm going to also paste these for the sake of time. We will create the database and set the character set to UTF-8 and the correlation to UTF-8 general CI for case insensitive. Then we will create a MySQL user. Please be sure to choose your own password here at this point and we'll create the user as Sununi at localhost. And then we will add the privileges to the user to access the database. And then we will finally flush the privileges so that they will be applied. Once all of this is done, we can then, once this is done, we can finish up by installing the database using the three scripts that are provided. One of them is to create the initial database schema. This can take a little bit depending on the speed of your server, but it should be quite quick. The second one will insert the initial data that's required for the base installation, like the groups and some default queues and all of the default settings. And the final script will run all of the triggers that are needed in order to keep your integrity of the database complete and intact. Uh, not the triggers, but I guess the foreign key constraints. Now that the database has been imported, or the base settings for the database have been created out of the scripts that were provided from the software, we'll configure the software with some very important settings. We have to add the database password and add some extra settings that would normally be done with the installer. by editing the default configuration file delivered with the software. To do this, we will go to the installation directory. It's an opt-snooney, and we will open the file kernel config.pm. And here, using the editor of your choice, we will insert some lines. You can copy these out of my script that will be provided below. We'll set the secure mode to make sure that nobody can uh, re-do our installation using the installer PL. We'll set a system ID, make sure that this, this is a random number, it's specific to your own installation. Then we can add the FQDN, here I'm just going to add the IP address. This is good, uh, this is important for session handling that you have the correct FDN or the, the URL that you're using to access the system is configured as the FQDN. Then we have the admin email address and we're going to send all of our automation mails to um, this example address. Of course, you add the address that's appropriate for your administrators. Please do not send those to the system as they're important to be had outside of the system. Next, we'll take the added precaution or the added setting of turning off the email or not completely turning it off, but turning it into um, a testing mode where we can test notifications and things like that by setting the send mail module to do not send email. Here we have the full function of the software without actually sending any emails. It will generate them as a mock-up and there will be communication logs involved and then you can test the system, test notifications and things like that. When you're ready to go into normal operation then you can change this back to send mail or SMTP, whatever your heart desires. So when we're done doing that, we'll go ahead and um, close this file. And now we can do some final configurations by uh, rebuilding the configuration. We'll do this in the context of the Snooney user. And we'll run this command. And we'll see what we've forgotten to do. If we go back in to edit our script, when we use our script, we forgot to set our database password. 
we use the password uh, for the Znuni user, we use the password secret. It's sometimes good when things go wrong, because we can talk about a little bit of troubleshooting. And after we're done with that, we should be able to rebuild the configuration now with no problem. When the configuration is rebuilt, we'll go ahead and save ourselves a little bit of time logging in by building the loader cache files. Using this command, we can generate our loader cache files for when we want to log into the system. And the last and final stage that we're going to do on the command line is to reset the default password for the system user with the ID1, which is the super user, never operate as the super user, and we'll generate a local admin on the command line and we'll start the automation tasks. Also these commands can be done in the context of Sununi. I always do these things in the context of Sununi. First off, the reason for working in the context of Sununi is that the scripts require it to make sure that the permissions and the files that are created are created properly. And secondly, working using the su command, you can always be sure that you're, it doesn't matter where you're in the file system, that you're always going to have the correct path in your history for doing maintenance tasks. So using this command will allow me to add in administrator user. Uh, we'll have to take another example because the example doesn't com doesn't work, but I think test.com does. Zanuni checks the MX records per default to aid your agents, your users, to not make mistakes when entering email addresses. Then I'll set the password for the admin user. We'll have to remember this password to log in, and I'll reset the local host user password. We can go ahead and copy our admin user password, and then we'll log into the front end. Before we log into the front end, let us do two last things though. Let us start the cron, or start the daemon, for running automation tasks. And let us start the cron to make sure that the automation task continues to run. So if we look at the user of the cron tab, uh, the cron tab for the user at Sununi, we see that every five minutes it checks to make sure the daemon is still running. Now to access the user front end, you go to the fqdn forward slash Sununi forward slash indexpl, and we can put in our admin user password. And when we're ready, we click login, and you'll be logged into your new system. And in the coming videos, weeks, uh, and months of the progression of the product, Sununi 7, I will continue to add new video content for tips and tricks, how to configure your system and how to best use it. When you log in, you'll first be presented with the dashboard, and the first thing that you're going to be asked to do is set your time zone. These are in the user preferences. This is the first thing that we'll do by clicking on this link scrolling down to the user time zone area and choosing the location where we are. By saving the setting, we can go back to the desktop and begin to use the system. I hope you have fun with this video, hope you have success, and if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me in the comments or to come to our community. Also, the community links and resources will be listed in the user notes at the bottom. Thank you.